Good morning, my name is Dr. Alan Frankel, and I'd like to tell you a little story to start with. 17 years ago, I woke up one day with a terrible cough and shortness of breath, and over a couple of weeks, instead of this viral chest infection going away, I ended up having congestive heart failure. The virus went to my heart. I had to quit my practice, and I really didn't know what I was gonna be doing with the rest of my life, and I was told I had six months to live. Um, that's actually the first time that I ever used cannabis, even though I grew up in the late 50s and 60s. And I'm not saying that the cannabis healed me, but certainly it made me feel tremendously better, more optimistic. And over a three month period, for whatever the reason was, I got better. So as I was getting better, I started reading about cannabis. I'd never used it before. And I became really, really um, shocked by how much science there already was 15 years ago. And I decided to pursue medical cannabis and continue using CBD and other cannabinoids. Um, today we'll be talking about normalization of cannabis. And what normalization means to me is that uh, for the patients, for the people who want to use casual use of cannabis or edibles, that's great. I love every part of the plant. But there's a lot of people who need to see cannabis as a normalized medicine. So it seems like a capsule or a spray or a patch. Um, in some situations, rectal suppositories, rectal syringes with dosed amounts of cannabinoids so that we always know on every situation how many milligrams of CBD, THC, THCA, CBDA, and some ideas of terpenes. And for me, that's normalization of cannabis. So you're taking a capsule and swallowing it with water or better even yet, a, a, sip of, a sip of olive oil. And all of our patients that we see, it's kind of an unusual practice. We don't do much in the way of casual cannabis medicine. Um, our patients don't want to smoke. They don't want to get stoned. And they're sure to tell me that when they come in immediately. And I hope by the end of this talk that you will feel like I do, that cannabis is being normalized. And it works, well, for, for the most part, much better than most standard pharmaceutical medicines that are available. And that's why at times pharmaceutical companies get a little upset with us. Um, the cannabinoids. Um, there's going to be a, a lot more talk about the endocannabinoid system, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But let me introduce myself. Um, Alan Frankel, I graduated UCLA Medical School, did my internship residency um, there, became a, a clinical professor, and I did uh, clinical medicine at UCLA for about 13 years. Um, then when I got sick, which was about 20 years, 22 years into my practice, I had to close that practice and um, decide what I was going to do. And as I was reading more, I decided to go into cannabis. Um, the, the cannabinoid molecules, there are three forms of cannabinoids. One are the endocannabinoids that are inside our body and pretty much are involved, I think we'll find with nearly every cell in the body. Um, and every animal species back to fish, any animal species that has a vertebra actually has an endocannabinoid system. So when people talk about our dogs and cats, it's, it's fish. And, you know, fish even have an endocannabinoid system. And actually, I believe that a lot of the rectal use of cannabis is mostly ending up going to the fish. <laughs> so the molecules, the endocannabinoids, are uh, um, anandamide and 2-AG, or 2-arachnodoyl glycerol, which is really impossible to say. And 2-AG is very similar to the plant cannabinoid or phytocannabinoid CBD. Anandamide is much more similar to THC. And one of the reasons that cannabis is such special medicine is that when we ingest as humans with an endocannabinoid system, the phytocannabinoids, they trigger our endocannabinoids to be more active. And that's exactly the opposite of what most medicines do. When we take neurotransmitter medicines and we take hormonal medicines, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, I mean, the list goes on and on, it suppresses our internal production of it. So if we then need to stop that medicine, we end up with a really big problem. So CBD and THC have a negative or reverse tolerance. The longer you use them, the less you need. Now, the, the, the THC stony feeling, the psychoactive feeling, is really just a side effect that people 
like, a lot of people like it, but most patients out there, 85 plus percent, do not like getting high. They often try THC, they get paranoid, agitated from it, and the plant used to be a very balanced plant, changed a lot in the 50s, 60s, and 70s because of people like me, except I, I wasn't using it back then. And ultimately, we lost CBD, brought it back, and now we have many, many strains with different ratios of CBD and THC. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen now are the endocannabinoids um, and the plant-derived cannabinoids. And the most important thing to look at uh, with regard to the slide is how similar the endocannabinoids and the phytocannabinoids look. And the, the only difference really is the endocannabinoids are a bit more open-bonded and open-ringed, and the phytocannabinoids, the plant medicines, are three closed rings for most of the cannabinoids. Uh, the major cannabinoids, I mean, the, there are 120 major cannabinoids. There are probably 80 to 90 minor cannabinoids, a couple hundred terpenoid, flavonoid, and plant waxes. And the plant wax actually maybe, not, maybe is not the most important of those, but it's one that people have not heard of. I mean, the first time that I saw an alcohol extraction in the, these plant waxes that feel like wax, you know, gooey, greasy wax, and it looks like something that would help skin conditions. It mostly gets thrown away as an artifact of alcohol and often CO2 extraction, um, but we're starting to collect the waxes. We can just go to places and get them, and they work unbelievably well for many, many, many topical conditions. Um, the a couple, THC, I think we all have heard of, is a psychoactive cannabinoid, but it's not just a psychoactive molecule. It's extremely helpful with everything from cancer to pain, for a lot of people's anxiety, depression, which is not as well treated with CBD. When you start augmenting it with a little bit of THC, you start helping you know, mood issues much more. THCA is one of my new favorite cannabinoid molecules. It is the precursor of THC. Um, and the, the THCA molecule has a little acid ring on it that when you heat it by smoking, cooking, vaping, extracting, that, that comes off and goes off as CO2, then you have activated THC, which is also stony. But the raw molecule, the THCA molecule, has probably at least as many benefits as the THC molecule, and this is something we're trying on patients more and more. Uh, CBD we'll talk a, a bit more about, but it's a non-psychoactive molecule that has everything from anti-anxiety to anti-cancer, anti-proliferative effects, and we're finding out more and more and more about it literally on a daily basis. As a physician practicing cannabis medicine now for 11 years, what I knew I needed to help get done was to have an assortment of every possible, I mean, the more the better, extracts. And you have patients and you have extracts. After you start doing that for a number of years, you start figuring out which extracts work the best with which people. And there's a lot of personal adjustment all the time. The, on, the, on the slide, the last cannabinoid is listed as THCV, tetrahydroverin. Um, this is going to be a breakthrough that I believe will be bigger than CBD. It's a, mat it's a matter of finding a plant that has THCV in it. This mainly comes from African strains, and it's very, very tough to find. We've got some leads on them, and I'm hoping in the next year or two we'll have this molecule. The single most exciting thing about THCV, and this will be a big deal going forward, is that it effectively manages the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is that syndrome that's, I mean, in any state fair you go to, you see the metabolic syndrome. <laughs> Fat, uh, <laughs> diabetic, having elevated cholesterol, triglycerides, premature coronary disease, and diabetes. That's a big deal. And there are millions of patients like that that could benefit. Um, the entourage, entourage effect. I, lo I love the name. I love the show. What, it was first described by Ethan Rousseau, and it was also described by Meshulam in Israel. And I'm not sure who described it first, but it's a concept that, which makes just so much sense that all the molecules in the plant work together to help the patient, whether the patient is a human or a dog or, or a fish. Um, so the 
the number of millions of years that this goes back, the endocannabinoid system, and perhaps the, the exogenous cannabinoids from the plant could be close to a million years old. We really don't know. We do know from some German scientists working a few years ago, um, studying the Ice Age in Denmark, that CBD pollen was available and went down with people, went south as the Ice Age went south, and they were planting this. So it's tens and tens of thousands of years old. The, the entourage effect includes all the cannabinoids, I mean, all the molecules, um, the, the, the terpenes, the waxes, the minor cannabinoids. And when we talk about um, hemp, or we talk about molecular CBD that's made in the laboratory using, by the way, the US federal patent of <laughs> March 3rd, I think March 3rd, 2003, um, is surprised when we found that. We didn't, that, pat, I, that patent was not found online until about 2008. And there are now, by my count, about 500 US federal patents on cannabis. So I don't believe they think this is a terrible medicine. I think they think this is so good that they want to keep it con under control, and it's difficult to do that. But spending a minute on hemp is worthwhile, and I hope there are, there are not too many people here that are in the hemp business, but I think hemp as a fiber plant is amazing, and that's what we should be using it as. The federal government um, treats CBD from hemp exactly the same as cannabis. There's no difference, it's just a difference in enforcement for now, and that will change. Um, federally, you can only extract the, the flowers of the hemp plant, and any of you that have seen hemp plants, there's just not much there. So the hemp medicine that we have available around the world virtually all comes from China and Latvia and a couple other countries. It's dirty medicine because hemp is really good at drawing heavy metals out of the ground and other poisons, but we're not supposed to be eating it. We're supposed to be building with it, making paper, fuel. And it's lacking the entourage effect. So the, the bottom line with hemp-based medicine, and I, I apologize for anybody who disagrees, but the, it doesn't work nearly as well as whole plant cannabis. It's not, it's not even close. Um, and there are some states now that there are beginnings of some federal investigations and, and taking down these places. I have mixed feelings about that because I'm pretty liberal-minded, but I, I think there needs to be much more education. And it's going to be a fight because there's a lot of money on both sides. But for my money, I stick with cannabis and use hemp for building and everything else. Cannabis and the P450 system. Um, we're talking now about the metabolism of all the cannabinoids. They're virtually all metabolized in the liver. The liver has a very, very, very complex group of hundreds of enzymes, and it's called the P450 system. I don't know why, but it's called the P450. And if you have two drugs that are competing for all those enzymes, there could be an issue. If you have five drugs, if you have drugs at a higher dose, at some point, the number of enzymes that are available in the P450 system in the liver will be inadequate, and there'll be competition. Medications won't be metabolized as much, and levels can build, be built up. Fortunately, GW Pharmaceuticals, 10 years ago, spent about four years looking at the reality of drug interactions of drugs using the P450 system and cannabis. The reality is it's very rarely a problem, and I believe it's rarely a problem because CBD certainly uses those enzymes, but as it starts coming through the liver, it sends messages to increase the number of P450 enzymes to metabolize itself. Very, very clever. Um, for seizure kids, I mean, you need to check their levels, but more doing this for a number of years now, we don't really see much in the way of issues with the, with the seizure meds, um, the cancer drugs. And under doses of whole plant CBD, THC, under about 40 to 50 milligrams, there's just no substantial use of the um, P450 system. So it's something to be aware of, always think about, but it's not the problem that it might be. Um, on the screen now, you're seeing a picture of um, CB1 and CB2 receptors. The CB1 receptors are primarily in the nervous system, not just the brain. The CB2 receptors are in the gut, 
and in the immune system, and there's a huge overlap in between. My guess is since every six months we're finding new places where the endocannabinoid system has receptors, that will continue, and it's not going to be just CB1, CB2. There's going to be CB100, CB1000. There's just a, a number of places they act, and we're learning more. The, the second picture is a picture of the brain with receptors, CB1 receptors, everywhere in the brain, except for one place, and that's the point of this slide. There are virtually no receptors in the brainstem. The brainstem is a part of extension of our brain back here that takes care of those boring things like breathing, <laughs> your heart beating, and if, whatever drugs you take, if it doesn't affect your breathing or stop your breathing, doesn't affect your heart rate or stop your heart, you might be miserable, you might be asleep, but you're not dead. And that's the reason uh, cannabis cannot kill people. Um, here's an, an, another slide that is on the endocannabinoid system, and uh, the, it's showing a presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. And when nerves are connected not by hardwire, they're connected by chemical packets. And when an, uh, a neurotransmitter is released from a presynaptic to a postsynaptic receptor, that triggers the creation on the fly of anandamide and 2-AG, then, then goes reverse back to the presynaptic and then modulates the neurotransmitter. So this is cannabis and CBD in particular are amazing modulators with neurotransmitters, with catecholamines, with calcium, and many, many other molecules. Cannabinoids as essential nutrition. Um, I kind of, this slide kind of ha makes a couple of points, but the reason, at least that I believe, that this vegetable or, or herb, it's kind of a vegetable, it's not a fruit, um, it's certainly not a house, it's, it's a vegetable. It's not much different than the tomato plant. It probably came onto the planet about the same time as a tomato plant. And it's interesting, from 1400 to 1600 in Europe, the tomato plants were illegal. They were considered to be poison and dangerous. And now I think we consider tomatoes safe. And, but there, <laughs> there have never been studies. As far as I know, there's no study showing the safety of tomatoes. And to me, I, I know you understand the point here, but these are fruits and vegetables, and it's, it's insane what's happened. Um, and when I'm talking to patients, I find myself all the time thinking, I mean, how is it doing so many things? How is it possible? Well, if it's key nutrition and we're missing it, how is it different than scurvy that'll kill you in three months? Or beriberi, or there's a lot of nutritional diseases throughout history that have killed millions of people that were just simple nutritional deficiencies. Um, I mean, to have something that will work on irritable bowel and migraines, fibromyalgia, cancer, chronic pain, seizures, autism, I mean, it doesn't make sense unless you, I think you think of it as nutrition. Um, there are a number of actions of the cannabinoids. Uh, let's first talk about anti-inflammatory. All of them have fairly potent anti-inflammatory actions. THC-A, the, the acid version, the raw version, the precursor for THC, might be the most powerful anti-inflammatory of the cannabinoids, but CBD has a tremendous amount of anti-inflammatory, CBDA, the precursor. So these are powerful anti-inflammatory medications, and I really don't need to mention all the diseases that could benefit from inflammation. I mean, there's inflammation with virtually every, every disease. Um, another major functional attribute is its antispasmodic properties. Um, and this can be antispasm of an esophagus, of a bladder, over uterine spasm during a woman's menses, um, it also can be muscular, I mean, skeletal muscle. So it's GI muscle, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, all are relaxed by CBD and uh, other cannabinoids. Mitochondrial modulation. This is getting a little fancy, but uh, this is something you're gonna be hearing more and more in the future. When we started seeing our first myasthenia gravis patients, uh, we realized that THCA was one of the most valuable molecules there. And 
and we're using THCA, CBD, and THC for a number of these neurological conditions. And finally, the immune system modulation. Um, CBD does decrease B cell, T cell function. I've not seen or heard of any complications yet by having that immune suppression, but it's something we need to think about in diseases, and there may be other interactions. I mean, certainly early man had the cannabis, but they didn't have all these other pills, so we don't know for sure if it, what happens with, with all of these medications. The medical cannabis visit, um, let me run through this very quickly. The, this is where a doctor is interacting with a patient, and you need to know, as opposed to casual cannabis, the patient complaint. You know, what is the patient's complaint specifically? What is this expected outcome? The, if you're using casual or recreational cannabis, um, the, pretty much everybody knows the outcome is you're getting a little stoned. There's not big discussion about what outcome you want. Um, the, the, the THC experience is also a very important one. I mean, it's critical. Um, the problem is with most of the patients, at least that I see, either they never used cannabis or they used it once very, very sh short time, one or two uses, got paranoid and stopped. So most statistics in most countries show that 85% of the population does not like smoking weed and getting stoned. 15% of people want to do that. The other 85% want dose-consistent medicine. Um, as far as dosing in general, you've heard, you know, go s start low and go slow, but that's only most of the time. There is situations where people have severe pain and you have to ask them if they want to possibly endure a little psychoactivity in order to get the pain relieved or they want to do it slower. Um, finally, uh, what patients need and doctors need to work with are consistent and accurate dosages. And this is where it's important, I think it's critical for doctors to be involved to promote medical cannabis. And the medications need to be the same every single time, otherwise how in the world does a doctor work with it? So I would say over the last seven years we have normalized cannabis. It, we see capsules, we see sprays, we see some rectal suppositories for certain conditions, we see modes of administration for consistent medicine that will be the same every single time the patient orders it. If it's not, as a doctor, I don't know how to take care of those patients. So I would say the answer to the question we pose, cannabis can be a normalized medicine, and I think there's a long ways to go, and we're going to be enjoying this for many, many, many millennia. Thank you.